สวัสดีเจ้า I am Pim k e m a s i n k i editor of City Life and I am back with Tiggy little Miss Tiggy Winkle and my dear friend Chris Barkley so we're here today no longer in the day bed I'm afraid summer has come sweat is pouring foreheads are shiny and so we're sitting indoors y- yeah I, I can see it <laughs> it's not a forehead it's a five head at this point Bless. Yeah. So Chris and I have um, an, an exciting thing, a, a little endeavor we're working on, but this isn't some kind of sales pitch because, frankly, we're not selling it. But we do want to discuss about how we got here. Chris is a friend of mine for the last what, 10 years? At least, yeah. At least 10 years. He's lived in Chiang Mai for 13 years. 13 years, and we have shares together in a little Japanese restaurant somewhere in town. So that was how we met. And Chris owns three hotels, four hotels. In China. In China. And they're very eco, um, sustainable type hotels and beautiful. I went to the one in Yangshou. Right. And my God, it was like one of those, you know, one of those sort of, you know, peaky postcardies, bamboo rafting, swing bamboos, misty mountains, you know, crystal clear waters. It was just obnoxiously spectacular and cold. Because you made We, me go there in winter. I made you, yes. Well, it was a, a group of us, as I recall, and um, we kind of took over the whole place because it was really the middle of winter, and so not a lot of tourists. But I thought that was kind of cool. It was we had the whole place until know. he made me go on a three-hour bamboo rafting ride down the what river? Li River. Uh, the the Yulong River. The Yulong River. Yeah. At minus three. Okay, I think it was three degrees, wasn't it? <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful, beautiful, but my God, yes. if I had bollocks, they would have been frozen off. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, Chris, give, give our viewers a little bit of a, who are you? Yeah. Um, Earthling. Um, I like to call myself an Imagineer. I don't have a job. Um, I'm unemployable. I Imagineer, think you know that. that's a very big word for unemployable. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I basically daydream and... Um, try to make things from that. I always say that dreaming is a form of planning. So I love to plan, as you know, I'm a big planner. Such a big planner, my God. Yeah. He has and charts and stuff. <laughs> I do have charts. <laughs> and you shall know him by his charts. <laughs> so yeah, I, I love to just sit around and think about things and I kind of work in the margins. I don't do like big projects. I know the places that you visit in China, they're all small. Yeah. Um, and I like that about mm. them. I mean, I, I'm not about expansion and growth and you know conquering some market i'm really interested in sort of what other people aren't doing and um and i guess you could call that contrarian but i'm not like i'm not looking to go against the tide i'm just you know that obnoxious i hope not <laughs> but i just asked my wife she might have another opinion i I guess um, one of the things that I, I like to do is like is look at something because you know we're all in business, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it sounds kind of uh, boring to talk about it, but I like to look at something and say like, what what business are people not doing here? Like, what's mm-hmm. a what would be a great business that no one has thought of? Mm-hmm. You know, and just kind of ponder about that, and that leads to interesting things. You know, and. Sometimes they're they don't work, you know, and um, we know, right? <laughs> We've all been there, <laughs> right? But I mean, that's part of the fun. I mean, so yeah, I, I like this kind of thing. I mean, back in the '80s, uh, everybody was talking about Japan and Japan's taking over the world, and you got to learn Japanese. So I went to China. Uh, I mean, so <laughs> yes, where nobody was, and uh, you know, people in Mao suits on bicycles, that kind of yeah, thing. And I, I, I absolutely loved it. You know, I just fell in love with that country, and. Um, And I, to, you know, to this day... To I mean, do what? To, to tell us a little bit about how, how your China story started. Right. Well, I went there in college. I went there my junior year in college to study and stayed to my senior year. And uh, I was in Beijing, and I just loved it so much. That time, my 80s was a very free, open time in China. And um, yeah. it was just so what, great. What? Really? I was there in 88 in Beijing. I didn't feel so open or free. Oh, really? Okay. God, yeah. It was right before the, the Tiananmen, two weeks before. Well, I was there at that time. Huh. Yeah. So I might have run into you. Yeah. Didn't even know it. Were you wearing a mouse suit? Um, Were you no, on a bicycle? Oh, God, no. I was in really obnoxious 80s. Oh, really obnoxious. Oh, like, really, like really foofy hair? Oh, like everything. Bangles, foofy oh, hair. Oh, I, I, I can totally see that with It you. was not good. I mean, people were staring. You're people, like... I was an escapee from a mental asylum. Or Cindy Lauper, maybe. I could see They'd never heard like of Cindy Lauper, but yeah, I look just like her. <laughs> Cindy Lauper, I think. Is, yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, I spent quite a bit of time. Went back after I graduated, oh. um, worked for a hotel 
chain for a while, European hotel chain. That was really boring. Um, and then I started a business and stayed there a long time. Yeah. I was there 15 years. You were doing training? Yes, it was like a human resources company. Human, yeah, yeah. So basically a lot of cross-cultural communication. Yeah. Because you have like so many Chinese fresh out of college, they've yeah. never had jobs. They go to work for a big company like Nike who has a very aggressive corporate culture yeah. and they're like, they're just like deer in the headlights. They don't know what to do. Right. And the bosses are like, I can't believe we hired these people out of the best universities and they're morons. And I'm like, they're actually not. It's just the way that you talk to them. And so th that was a great job because... It must have been fascinating, you know, bridging two great... I mean, pff, the divide there must have been quite, right. quite something. Right. So it, it was not only the Chinese, but it was also the foreign managers who were there because they had no cultural training whatsoever. I mean, the, most of the American companies that yeah. I worked for, their whole MO was like, well, this guy's a good engineer, so we're going to bring him over to China to work with the other engineers. He's never led a team. He doesn't know anything yeah. about China. So he gets over there and he's like, all right, people, listen up. And it's like gives this pep talk and the Chinese are just like, it's like, you know, crickets. And he's like, I don't think that they're paying attention or right. they're, they're, they're not good thinkers or something. And it was always sort of like this, um, there was a lot of problem solving mm -hmm. to do with teams. And then um, the other thing was how to train up the Chinese to basically take over when the foreigners left. Right. You know, so that secession planning and then basically, you know, all the things, all the tools that these, the Chinese managers would need to be successful in a Western corporate culture, which was really challenging. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's just so opposite, right? <clears throat> And so, did you sell that company, or you moved yeah. on, or what? Yeah, I gave oh. it back to my, well, I had partners, so I basically right. gave it to them, and I said, uh, you guys are going to need to run this company, because I'm moving to Chiang Mai. Bye! Well, you <laughs> met a, a lovely lass at the Horn Bar, Mandarin Oriental. Yes. The Horny Bar. Yeah. Yes, and then yeah. the rest is history. Right. But, so, our project, which we shall get into later, because we're, we're teasing you, that's what all this is about. Got it. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Yeah. So tell, tell me, like, how did, because it was your idea, this is this, his baby, how, how, did, how did that come about? What were you thinking? Over years. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> I like the way you put that, because you could have emphasized the what were you thinking. I could have. Um, yeah, what was I thinking? Um, so, first of all, I felt like... Um, there was something missing here in terms of having a place to go for all of us. And I think we talked about that from the very beginning. We were like, you know, if you want to get together with friends. So now when I get together with my buddies, we go to a Mexican restaurant every Friday night because it's no one else goes there. <laughs> By the way, it's excellent food. Can I plug it? It's plug fantastic. It. Mexican Grill. It's on Canal Road right before Sutep Road as you come north. Fantastic. Got shares in that one too? No. Um, but the, the hostess, I should say, the owner and the chef, she's like, a, she's like a thousand armed Guan Yin well, back enough there. Enough fucking now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> lovely person, great chef, great food, great service, and um, it's pretty quiet. She could use some more customers. So I'm willing to give up a little bit of, uh, you know, our privacy for, uh, to help her out. So, so that, that's kind of like what we're, what we're facing when we want to get together with people. Or you could spend a lot of money and go to a fancy hotel. For me, as a single woman, right, right, like in the old days, um, I didn't have to think about going anywhere because, as an editor, I'd inv be invited places, so it was my job. Right, right. So I would just be invited out, three, four events every night, and I just handpick where I wanted to go to, and sure. I kind of just bump into the same people or new people, whatever. Whereas then, this all happened, and right. suddenly, no one's ever invited me anywhere because they just assume that I'm always invited somewhere, but there's nothing happening. Right. So suddenly, I don't know where to go. I don't know. Like, I can't walk in a place, of, well, I can, but then I just sit there like a sad little Muppet on my own. Mm. So it is a problem socially here. Right. And I, I, to, yes. So you can meet similar like-minded people or people who are Quintarian and who, who, but who can converse with. Right. And we talked about sort of what's your local, because I'm a relative newcomer here, right? Mm. You've been here for a long time. And so, and I, well, I, you know, you, you're, My you're, life. yeah, and you're like, you know, big into the social scene. So I asked you, remember, I was like, well, where did you, where do you and your friends all used to go? And you said yeah. the drunken flower. And I said, well, tell me about that. That and, was 20 years ago. Right, right. And that's something that I have no real context. Mm. So, um, so you said some things and you said it was a lot about the owner. And I said, okay, yep, I, that makes sense. And it was the people who went there. Yeah. It's, it's really about that. I so, made some of the, my best friends 
um, in Chiang Mai 20 years ago, the Drunken Flower, and right. also some of the most interesting people. It was just this charming, charming little place at the end of Soi Wan. Right. Thai, expat, poor, young, rich, gay, straight. Right. And we would just sit there and just pull tables together and just yes. talk. And so it was a very special spot, yeah. Yeah, so in a way we're, we're, we're recreating that um, in terms of having a place where you're part of a tribe. Mm. So this tribe can be defined basically by the by the people who belong to it, and it doesn't matter who they are. The fact is that they belong, and they yeah. feel a sense of of status or perhaps a certain kind of um, of they're they're welcome. You know what I mean? Like you feel status. like you're status. Status is important. Status is important. Isn't, isn't that word a bit off putting? I mean, you know, d d aren't people going to think that we're snobs? Mm. Status is a driver of culture. It really is. Um, you That's can't great. have a culture without status. Like, there's hierarchies in everything, right? And I, I'm not saying that status means that you're above people, but it, you, you want to be, you have to sort of figure out where you are in, in the culture. And so we're talking about, like, what's a great business that no one else is doing? I'm saying, well, what's a, you know, what would be, a, what would be an interesting culture that we could create where people felt a sense of belonging mm. um, and status. And the status is like, I belong here. Like, that's a kind of status. It doesn't okay. mean necessarily like a financial status. Or, right. Or, or, or that a, word was a bit off-putting to me when you said mm, it. But it's but true. I, I hear where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, so power is another kind of status. But we're not really talking no. about that. We're really talking about, I think, the status of belonging to something. Right. Because I never feel like I belong, particularly, when I go someplace. You know, You have to create that. So that this is, is an opportunity for all of us, all the pe members, to create that, you know. Yeah, where everybody culture knows matters. your name. Right, culture matters. And I, I yeah. feel like that's a big thing that's missing from a lot of businesses here. So what kind of people did you, did you envision that or, will we get in into this? We haven't actually even explained what we're doing yet, have we? No. <laughs> uh, well, do you want to say something about okay, it? Okay, it's a club. It's a members club, social club. And it's not about being posh or being anything like that. It's about... I like people, hence the multiple personalities that I've got here and here. <laughs> I, yes. do, I do like people and I like talking to people. And I do struggle to find, you know, people to talk to sometimes, um, people to challenge me, people who have new perspectives. Right. Um, for me, the journey, it's more not just about what your opinion is, but how you got to it, you know, because okay. everyone's personal journey shapes their opinion. And it's that personal journey that defines it and yeah. also that gives it legitimacy and it makes me want to hear it because then yeah. I have to be empathetic to it because just an opinion standing alone I don't necessarily have to be have any emotional connection to it but if I know the journey of how you formed it right that's something I can empathize with and I think yes. that's why I'm kind of doing this and I think that's also why I kind of want to do this club that we want to do well you're already doing it this yeah. is doing that. You're already having meaningful conversations, trying, you know, you know, always learning, always finding out like what yeah. makes people tick. I mean, that that's yeah. and now what if we could expand that and include a lot of people who feel the same way. Exactly. You know, who also in, enjoy the art yeah. of conversation. Yes. And, and um, who will participate and not just be an audience right like we're not putting on a club for people to experience members will be the club right it, we will obviously set our members make the club it's like a it's yeah. like any network right yeah. the value of the network and you talk about yeah. uh there's something called metcalf's law which says that the value of any network is equal to uh the square of the number of users connected to it okay so as the network grows mm. the value of that network grows and so it really all depends on the quality of the people in that network. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so, we will be getting quality people. And it's absolutely. not about money. It's not. It's really not. I personally want to do a bit of a Robin Hood thing. You know, we're going to have some wealthy members who will be paying and supporting some of our less wealthy members. Absolutely. That's yeah. how a club should be. And, it, right? and, and, and to your point, it really is about participation. You, you, it's about engagement. If you're going to sit on the sidelines, there's really, I don't think there's really anything for you there. No. Um, and I think we've been really... I think you and I are really aligned on kind of that this is not for everyone. No. You know, and that as a Thai, you know, from a Thai perspective, um, we're, that's we're not bit, for everyone. <laughs> definitely not. Um, you know, uh, we could talk a lot more about that, but I think your viewers would be interested. So it's like um, this exclusivity is maybe uncomfortable for some Thais. 
and maybe for some, you know, some foreigners too. But we're not making it exclusive in terms of you have to be, you know somebody or you have to have money or whatever or, or no. position. It's really not of interest. No. Uh, I think we're a lot more interested in attracting people who have something to say, who have some contribution that they've done something interesting. It's a taste makers. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Chris likes his his catchy words. Taste makers. Merry makers. Troublemakers. Oh, oh gosh, no. Yeah, no troublemakers are allowed. Oh, we like instigators. We oh, like, oh, we oh, like these kind of people. There we go. There's another yeah. one. Okay, yeah. okay. I like but making no fights. It. No, no. No, not, not like that. No, no. no. Nice troublemakers. Yeah, yeah, we'll have like our etiquette, you know. Etiquette, yeah. Yes, I think one of the rules, well, I don't want to say rules, but one of the, one of the sort of conditions of, 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 of membership is that uh, you speak at a volume, uh, you speak at a volume that you would in your living room, not at a football game. You know, so we're not... No hooligans. Right, no hooligans, no screens, no... no. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. No screens. Yeah, this, that... is, this is going to be like, because we're going to confiscate your, your phones, basically. Yeah, you're, it's going to go in the phone jail if we catch you yeah. using it. And that's quite a big thing for Thailand, right? We don't want people coming in, taking selfies, taking pictures, checking in locations. Nah. Well, nah. When, when some of my, like, you know, uh, young Thai friends, when they ask about it and I tell them, yeah, it's not a place you'll use your phone, they just... They're kind of dumbfounded. I, and I just say, trust me, you'll hate it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So because, the, you know, yeah. they're so plugged in, they're so connected, they're always here yeah. or they're here. So I, you know, this is not about that. It's kind of, it, it's really taking a stand against that. Yeah. You know, I get annoyed. You know, you go out, sure. sit, you have supper and everyone around you is just sitting there. And like that's that. how you know you're old. I mean, so I'm <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no, but I it annoys me too, and I'm like, I'm allowed to be grumpy because you know I'm I'm, old. I'm an older guy. Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, so we're talking about culture. Uh, we're really taking a stand. And um, a tribe. The, the really the definition of a tribe is that it it stands alone. It 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 has enemies. For example, all tribes have enemies. Who's yeah? our enemy? Our enemy is complacency, cynicism. Right. Yeah. Urgency. This tyranny oh. of urgency, I hate that. Okay. And I'm kind of a, you know, I'm kind of a let's get it done now kind of guy. So this is like a different way of approaching that. It's like you can still get things done, but what's urgent versus what's important? And actually, and to be fair, it's yeah. taken us two years to even get off the ground. And it's because even though it is important very much to us, um, you know, we've, we've waited because it's not an urgent issue, right? We want to get it right. We yeah, I didn't want to open in the middle of COVID. Um, you know, originally we were going to put it here and then we both agreed like that was not a great idea. No, I should not have a, a bar in my house. Above, <laughs> yes, exactly, right above your bedroom where, yeah, you can just sort of stagger down the stairs. <laughs> to get it like one of those five minutes. Yeah, that's what we yeah, should no, do. Yeah, no, no, that won't be happening. Right. So, yeah, the, the I, I feel like that we, uh, we're, we defend the same stake in this culture and that yeah. is that we, we really honor this art of conversation and appreciative inquiry yeah. and real human connection. And I just felt like that was missing in a lot, yeah. of, in a lot of businesses here. Um, just a lack of human empathy mm -hmm. and just a lack of human connection and so that's what we're doing. Okay, exp expand on that a bit, uh, how it's missing in a lot of businesses. Well, I just think it's it's an afterthought for people, for most businesses. Right. It's because people are competing in kind of conventional um, it's all images now, quadrants yeah. of business. So, for example, uh, let's say you know you're you're looking at uh, you look in the old town. That's where our project is. Don't give it away where the location is. You will never find it. Never. Um, that's the whole point. Secret. You got to know where it is. Well, suck so, up, suck up too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So. Um, so let's say like these sort of standard quadrants of, of, of business, of, 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 of an enterprise. So you'd say, like if you go to the old town, you're going to see coffee shop, guest house, uh, uh, restaurant. Spa, boutique, yeah. Massage. Rinse and repeat. It's just that. It's just that. And, and, I, and it's, you, I think you're hard pressed to find any real like diversity or occasionally you find something that's cool, right? Or something that's been there a long time that just, mm -hmm. it has its culture just by by way yeah. of having been there such a long time, yeah. and the owner is, you know, involved. Um, there now are it's more design-driven, isn't it? It's it's all it's, it's all, all yeah. It's all Instagram-driven. It's all Instagram-driven. It's yeah. all Instagram-driven. If you open a coffee shop, I mean, I find that so many of these new things that are opening, they're definitely upmarket, but they're very much about 
social media and how it would look, you know, from the perspective of, you know, young, ambitious uh, Thais yeah. who want to signal sort of their status. Yeah. Again, going back status, to status, yeah. right? So that's Instagram. It's like, look where I am, look who I'm with. Um, then we're kind of doing the opposite of that. Um, and it's, um, yeah. it's a bit of a risk. So let's like, say if you're in these, these quadrants of sort of quality versus service versus price, well, everyone's sort of like working within those quadrants, yeah. right? So you're really in a commoditized market. You're never really differentiating yourself in that way. You can have a cheaper cup of coffee. You can have a little bit better service. But you're always looking over your shoulder yeah. in terms of like someone can just come along and say, I'm just going to do it faster, yeah. right? I'm just going to do a little bit cheaper. Yeah. But we've made our own quadrant here. We're, we're really, we're not competing because we know what we stand for. And when you know what you stand for, you don't have to compete. Damn right we do. Ooh, I'm excited. Me too. I hope this works out. <laughs> Me too. Um, so you, you, you know, as you said earlier, yeah. you, you know, you, you spend a lot of time thinking and daydreaming yeah. and, and, and planning and everything. Absolutely. And, and you, you like your like-minded people. So yeah. um, Chris does this, this quirky little thing that he does once a year and he goes walking All right. along some, some random trail somewhere. Tell us a little bit about, about that, because I think it, it, it really defines who you are quite a bit. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't think it was so interesting. Yeah. But, um, well, I happened to meet a, a, a super interesting fellow named Kevin Kelly um, many years ago, like five or six years ago. And um, this is the guy Tim Ferriss calls the most interesting man in the world. Um, he's, a, he's very hard to describe. But anyway, um, Kevin is a... Uh, he's an author and a speaker um, and an early internet uh, person. Um, and so, you know, we, we both have a connection to China, it turns out. Um, his wife is from Taiwan. He spent a lot of time in the Far East, so actually traveling all over the world. And uh, but he also has a kind of affinity for China. He goes back and travels. He gives talks there a lot to all these big tech companies. All right. Okay. And part of that is he'll take a week when he's after his talk and he'll go and explore somewhere. So we just started exploring together, just going out in the countryside and do it. And it involves a lot of walking. And so, you know, when you're and out, talking, well, you just naturally talk, right? <laughs> and Kevin's like, we should do a walk and talk. And so, okay. And we have a good friend in Japan, Craig Mont, who's an amazing guy. And he's got a, his whole kind of business. So the book guy. Book yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he basically going around to different uh, pizza toast restaurants all over Japan. It's a Japanese thing, pizza toast. I think it was left over from the war and the Japanese oh, sort really? of started making their, well, they made their own kind of Yeah, I've seen pizza. them. Uh, they haven't attracted me enough to try. But No, mm. you, you wouldn't. I mean, otherwise, unless you're in Japan and really hungry. But um, so, so Craig, we, so th they did one in Japan. Um, I didn't go on that one. But the next year we went on the Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage trail uh, that runs both from the, Pyrenees in France, and then up from the, the Portuguese coast to the, the tomb of St. James. Yeah. Um, have you been up there? It's no, beautiful haven't. in the northern of Spain. Oh, no, maybe amazing. to the south. So Kevin invited a group of people, mostly Silicon Valley people that yeah. he knows, and we all just walked. We'd walk 12, 15 kilometers a day. And you're talking and you're meeting different people along as you go, right? So it's yeah. like you kind of hang out with this little subgroup and then maybe have lunch in the afternoon, you're with another person as you walk. It depends on your pace and it just also depends on kind of mutual interest in a topic. And then every night we'll sit down and have a, a single topic conversation over dinner. Love it. It, it's, it really takes a little bit of yeah. work to be honest. So really? Kevin is the convener. He basically moderates the dinner in a way. So if we're getting off topic or if there's sidebar conversations, he'll stop it. Oh, wow. And then he'll say, well, let, let's explore X, Y, Z a little bit more. It's, it's super, yeah. it's super it, takes, it takes a bit of discipline because sure. it's not just a free form conversation where everyone's yeah. talking over each other or, hey, let's get a selfie. It's like, it's, it gets quite deep. And these are big topics, you know. I feel uh, like this is a kind of a root a bit of, of, of where we're going. You know, well, it really inspired me. Yeah. It really inspired me. And then I organized one in China right before COVID. It was at the end of 2019. And a different group of people came along. Um, and again, it was just super, super interesting because, you know, the, the people are really what determine the dynamic of the conversation. Yeah. And you have billionaires and you have authors and you have artists and you have photographers and you have scientists i mean you know so you there's just like a almost unlimited range of things yeah. that you can you can learn and talk about and then over dinner the topics are like money <laughs> yeah work 
Oh, I, mean, I didn't expect it to be that sort of... Very, very broad. Well, but that is accessible to people. So every day, each person gets a chance to, to uh, choose a topic. And it's like a week-long type of hike. Yeah. And we're going to do one in Thailand, 2023. Oh, we're going to start on Mount Intanon. Oh, wow. And we're going to walk down. And, and then come, end up, and come to our, our we little will club afterwards. end up at, at the club. Yes, at we will. Club. Yeah. yeah. So how have you, um, you know, you, you, you came up with this concept, right? And can we tell you the name or? The Walk and Talk? No. The, the club? Yeah. Yeah. The okay. Algonquin. The Algonquin. That's the name of our club. Yeah. Which is a bit of a, you know, it doesn't roll off the tongue for the average Thai person. Right. So we have a Thai name for it. It's Gongan. Algonquin. Gongan. Huh? Gongan. It's like. Sounds my tones are probably bad. It sounds like come together. Come together. Gong, 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 gong. I can show you the character. Yeah, you definitely can't say it properly. <laughs> you just write it out for me sometime. But um so Point taken. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No worries. To insult. No. Um, explain what is it? as a tribe, yeah. Right, well, okay, so it goes back to the in, the idea of a tribe. So the Algonquin are a group of American Indians, or we say Native Americans, who all speak this common language of Algonquin. And so when settlers came, they, they kind of defined these tribes as the Algonquin peoples mm. because of this common language. But you have like Chippewa, you have Ojibwe, you have Mohawk, there are lots of different subgroups of these mm. tribes. But the point was they all had this language. So I thought, well, that's a, that's a great idea that people come from different parts and they all sort of convene and they all speak this common language. What's our lingua franca? Frank positivity, optimism. Uh, yeah. Chiang Mai. You know, this is our commonality as well, right? Yes. I, I, I think, uh, well, again, like we're taking a stand. It's what we're taking the stand against. It's, it's cynicism. Mm. It's, it's negativity. It's complacency. Um, you know. So, yeah. So I, I, I like the idea that this is a tribe that's defined by a kind of well-being. Yeah. You know, it, this is, it really exists to, to promote that among our members. Um, yeah. No, no, just well-being, because Chris walks, he jogs, he diets, he fitnesses, he's meditating, he's thinking, <laughs> and I'm just... You're just being, Pim. <laughs> You're really good at being. I'm really good at doing. Okay. You're really good at being, so I need to be more I need and to balance. do less balance out this all this perfection and yeah. The, yeah with this well you do a lot too though okay. you don't sell yourself short mm. i mean you're you're out doing lots of stuff right I but am. you're also pretty good at being just just being chill right I just am being pimp being chill. you're Hence good at being today's pimp. sort of um, i thought i'd sort of do a bit of a loungy thing considering i'm talking to very you know, good. a partner it's very and good by the way as an aside algonquin has a special meaning for me okay because when i was 16 i went dog sledding in canada's algonquin park it was minus 35 degrees. I went for five days, five nights, slept with like canvas tents with wooden sticks. Um, and it was marvelous. That was a, would it, that be a teepee? No, 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 it wasn't a teepee. It wasn't a teepee? Sadly. A wigwam? No, it was a, a, yurt? It was a tent. I'm trying to help you out here. No, it was a proper tent, sorry. <laughs> okay. But it was canvas, it had wooden sticks. Okay, so that, that's a nice sort of segue yes. into uh, the Algonquin Hotel. So the Algonquin Hotel, it's, um, it's on the Manhattan's west side, and it's been there since like 1902. And starting in 1920, it became a, a regular uh, lunch place for this group of writers. Yes. Um, Dorothy Parker, Noel Coward, um, and th these people would go on to obviously be, you know, sort of great American writers. Um, uh, uh, um, Kaufman started the New Yorker magazine. Uh, so there was a lot of you know, uh, a lot of people coming in and out of this of this group, and yeah. that was called the Algonquin Roundtable. Um, we and, do have some delusions of grandeur. <laughs> well, here's the thing, Pim. That group didn't know that they would be famous, right? Uh, they started see. off they're kind of poor, you know, like they're yeah. sitting off they're eating like egg sandwiches, or whatever. Like they didn't have money, they didn't have status. They just they loved to get together and talk, and they would just spend every day at lunch drinking and playing games, and then. Sometimes they'd, uh, you know, hang out, play cards, things like this. And it was a real, I mean, it was an intellectual exercise for them, but it was also just a lot of joking and pranking and just, you know, messing around. Yeah, and I which think, is what real intellectual exercise is. I mean, I've never seen, like, you know, really intelligent people sit around without taking the piss out of each other or play something, right? Is, Don't play take yourself is super seriously. important, right? Um, yeah. All forms of play. That's mm. how we learn as yeah. humans. So, 
uh, I love the idea of the Algonquin Roundtable. And I'm not saying like we're trying to recreate some kind of salon and we're only going to attract intellectuals or no. writers. And I mean, that's not... I don't really consider myself either of those things. So I don't really want people to have the idea like this is going to be like tweet jackets and pipes and no. sit around and, and talk about, uh, you know, talk about uh, the war. Burma. Yes. Uh, the Burma. Yeah. So anyway, so, <laughs> yeah, so no, it's not that. No. Um, although all intellectuals are welcome. Yeah. Uh, and we do have a smoking terrace. We do like for, characters, you know, people with, who, who can bring in some character, people, you know, raconteurs. Absolutely. Bon vivants. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yeah, and I think we know a lot of these people. You know, we do, you know. Yeah, yeah I know. So, I just try not to admit to it. <laughs> maybe you're one of them. Maybe when they talk about you, that's what they say. Oh, she's such a mm. bon vivant. You know? oh, I'd like that. I'd, I'd take that. Yeah. Yeah. So you've come here. You've spent 10 years. You go backwards and forwards to China. Right. Not now, obviously. Right. Not haven't so been for much. over a year, right. And, um, and so this is something that you want to do. What's the long-term vision for, for Algonquin? Well, it should definitely outlive me and, and you. Um, it's a long-term business, right? It's, and I, I, I hesitate to even call it a business. I mean, it, it is... Do you it, call it a social enterprise? It's not, uh, well, it, it's not like a charity, obviously. No, like a social it, enterprise puts people, planet, and profit, profitability on the same footing said my last interview, Antoinette Jackson. I like that. So I think that, that does define it quite nicely, doesn't people, it? People, profitability, and planet. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, people are obviously the, big, the biggest component. Yeah. Um, planet should definitely be right up there because when we talk about well-being, we're talking about obviously in our network, the well-being of our network determines sort of um, how, how that manifests outwardly. Sort of yeah. what kind of things are we going to do for Chiang Mai. You know, we've talked about doing like a creative agency. Um, I think the Algonquin's a perfect place to sort of find uh, those people that we want yeah. for, for that kind of stuff. Got so many ideas for Chiang Mai, right? So the problem is sometimes, you know, you're right, it's getting the right people to contribute because there's no budget, so we can't just go off and hire people. Right. So Chiang Mai is filled with such fascinating people who right. are so good at so many, many, many things and so many areas of expertise, yeah. it's quite shocking. But we just, we need to somehow bring them on board right. to a shared vision somehow for the city. Right. And that vision for me is, yes, it's an inside out kind of well-being, right? So that, it, it should be reflected in the, in, first in the well-being of our membership and that should carry out into yeah. interesting projects and things like that. And the other thing about it, in terms of the, the vision, I would say is that, that because it's, um, it's an invitation-only club, right? So we're really curating the, the members. And I feel like it should be a place, not like an incubator exactly. Like we're not trying to like be the place that's, that's growing ideas, but we kind of give birth to the ideas, for example. So... This is where you, you really, like, big ideas mm. happen. God, you know what I mean? Nice, it? Right? Because yeah. if you get enough people together with interesting mm. and different ways of thinking, um, like, amazing things happen. It's hard to, to, to sort of walk that line between, you know, being really, really excited, optimistic, and wanting this to happen, and being a bit pretentious. Mm. Well, I mean, this has to be an organic you know, process. Mm. We're not going to say like, hey, we need big ideas in here. We need yeah. to like, we want to exactly. be like the center of, you know, <laughs> you know, all big ideas. It's not at all. I mean, you can hang out and drink and do nothing if you like. It's for that. It's, it's, a, it's a refuge. It's yeah. an escape from all this crazy, mm. you know, social media nonsense. So, But it yeah. is kind of a curation, isn't it? You know, we're curating um, the people that we think will be able to contribute yes. towards one another's various endeavors or ideas or thoughts or whatever but you yeah. know and also to our shared vision yeah this is a self-selecting group so yeah. it's gonna automatically kick out the people who who wouldn't benefit from it or wouldn't like it yeah um and i think it's going to be a, a really powerful group in terms of ideas simply because of the synergy that happens when people start talking to each other right but if you're in a noisy coffee shop and it's like uncomfortable and there's like no, you know, all noise all around you. It's like for me, at least, it's really hard to have a conversation like this yeah. in a setting like that. Setting is very important. It is. It We've is. talked about the importance of of like comfortable chairs. 
I can't tell you how many times like I've been to a place in Chiang Mai where I'm sitting on either a plastic bench or oh, a, no. you know what I mean it's just uncomfortable like I can't right or there's traffic noise trust there's... me there's been a lot we've got we've got folders on on chairs and comfortable we, chairs we do comfortable, chair, comfortable chairs <laughs> the land of comfortable chairs yeah, yeah. yeah it's because it's important it is you know if you're gonna sit and talk to people for any length of time like you need the proper setting yeah yes yeah yeah yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I, I kind of feel like a bit of an asshole talking about all this and some people aren't going to be invited. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's why. You know what? Those <laughs> people wouldn't like it, Pim. No. You see what I'm saying? You wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it. It's not for you. No. It's not no. for you. It's going to be boring. You're going to be bored, right? Well, not me. Speak, no, I'm speak saying for yourself. I'm just talking to your audience. Oh, oh yeah, that yeah, one. If, if, if this doesn't sound like something that, that you know, interests you, then it's just, it, hmm. you're probably go with that that instinct. I mean, treat it like a gym membership. It's like if you're going to show up once a year and expect a benefit, it's not for you. No. You know what I mean? No. If you want to like, you know, uh, says she who's never had a gym membership. Well, you know, you've got your home <laughs> gym and I saw a trampoline out there. So, you know, it's, yeah. you're not doing nothing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's like so if you want to sit on the sidelines and, and not not participate, it's not for you. you no. Know? So uh, I feel really quickly people will will invite. I think you know, the, the, sort of the on the opposite side, you say, well, some people won't be invited. I think the people we do invite, there's going to be some that'll be like, yeah, this isn't oh, what yeah, I thought I'm it sure. was. I'm sure there you will know? be. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you've talked to a lot of people. Um, you've got a Thai wife, and uh, how how did, what her, what do her friends think about all of this? They like the idea of privacy, because this is a kind of you don't find this in Thailand so much. Everything's communal here. Everything's open here. Uh, the way they build houses, it's yeah. all communal, right? Um, and then we have our extended we family. We do. Like, I live with my extended family, and I love it, you know? Yeah. Um, I have very little privacy. Mm. And so that takes a bit of getting used to. But one of the core values of the Algonquin is privacy. Yeah. Um, no cameras, no, no screens, no, no phones. Um, and so for most Thais, they're like, yeah, that you can see them like, yeah, that's cool. Like, sometimes I want to get away. But the idea of something and then actually doing it or belonging to it is, is different. Mm. So, you know, I think a lot of people are excited about it. You know, the, the people that I feel would benefit from it, you know, when you start talking about mm. it, like, yes, th this is, you know, th th I'm sure you get a lot oh, too. A lot, people a lot. just like, when are you going to open? People keep asking me, like, when is oh, this I know. thing coming out? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, like, I've stopped even trying to hold things there. to a deadline. It is there. like going gangbusters. The construction now is like, off the charts, it's going so fast. Is it? Sorry, I've yeah. been for a couple yeah. of weeks. There's like, you know, last time I counted, there's like 16 workers over there. They're like, they got to do everything by yeah. hand because it's in this very what? small place. Let, let's let's zoom out a bit. Let's do yes. a big picture, right? Yeah. So, you know, you wanted to build this. You've got a beautiful young daughter. Yeah. Um, so unlike me, childless, I've got a, a pug. Um, I don't have to think about the future very much. Um, it's not really great of great, great concern for me. Do you not think about the future a lot? Uh, like after I'm dead? No, not really. I think you really live in the now. Yeah. I think you're really good yeah. at like right here, right now. I'm not right saying now. I'm not bothered about it. Of course mm. I am, but I'm, I'm bothered about plenty of things. So I'd rather just priority up. I, I'm I, bothered I, about plenty <laughs> of things. That's why I'm bothering. Well, everything bothers me, but I still. But that's why I like thinking about the future. You see, like, I don't. See, and I'm like, how can I make this better? Right. You see, I don't do that. So tell tell me what your vision is. What what are the the ails that you aim to or hope to see fixed? Are we still talking about the Algonquin? No, we're not. We're zoomed out now. Uh, okay, so we're talking about what, like Chiang Mai, no. Thailand? No, we're zoomed right, right out, like humanity, the planet, planet mm. universe, world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so these things obviously they're 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 connected. So whatever happens at the Algonquin it stays at the Algonquin. Whatever happens at the Algonquin, <laughs> obviously, we're hoping that will have a ripple effect. We'll hope that that will maybe something will will occur there that will that will have uh, some greater impact. Yeah. Um, and if you're asking what th that is, uh, I can't say like specifically, but if you want, ask me like what needs to be done, I mean, yes. there's tons of things that need yes. doing. Um, okay. Um, I feel like there's a lack of engagement on the part of a, a lot of Chiang Mai people. And, and I'll say that. And I don't mean like, so not, not only Thai people, but the foreigners who live here. And those are most of the people that I know. Yes. I don't have a huge number of Thai friends. Um, however, as you said, my family's Thai, so I, I do understand something about the culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like uh, part of it is the education system here, which is a very uh, 
teacher-centric, wrote memorization, and that's not unique to Thailand. It's all over East Asia. Yeah. But that kind of education, um, it creates a kind of passiveness that people feel like, well, the government will solve this, or the smart people will solve this, and I don't need to get involved. It's not my business. So, you know, the civil society, there's a healthy civil society mm -hmm. here, but it's still, I feel like, I mean, I, I, you know, I know people who run NGOs here, and it's, there's just really limited impact uh, for the most part, and from what I can see. I don't know. I'm, I'm, no, no, that, 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 that's interesting, and that, that, that's where I was sort of hoping we'd go with it, because, you know, you are look, we are looking at the big picture, and that kind of dovetails back into our Algonquin again. Isn't right, it? You know, right. That you've got to actually just step up and do something. Yeah. Right, and right I, or wrong. Yes, and I... I whatever space. Yes, and you're you're really good that way. Like you're you're an instigator, you know, with your garden fair and everything. You're doing stuff, that right? Shit's stirring. Yeah, fine. <laughs> you are. You're making trouble. That's what we. I mean, you should be doing because it's like yeah. you see something that needs doing. You see something that that's maybe unjust or just needs it. It needs fixing. And like, why why not you? I need a bar to go to that I have. People know my names and my drinks. So why not? Why not? Yes, I mean, you're being facetious because I, know, I, I because once you get there, there's going to be this bloom of of great ideas. Yeah. I really believe. I really so. believe so too. Um, and I'm kind of avoiding this zoomed out question because it's it's. Um, well, okay, let me hmm. go there then. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say names, so don't worry. But you, you know. know, for instance, Chris and I the other day sat down with someone who, um, been in town for years and years and years and years, and hasn't really um, engaged um, in any way. This is here. a brilliant person, by the way. He is like borderline savant. Yeah. Yeah. And and world level famous, well, whatever, successful, that sort of thing. But um, he, he wants to get engaged after many, many years here because he wants his family to live here long term and be able to breathe the, the air that, right. that they breathe every day. So suddenly he wants to get involved. And I want to, I, this is exactly the sort of people that I think we should gather around yeah. us, you know, people and that that may not have been very engaged, but have a, now have a channel a way of coming in Correct. and seeing how they can bring their unique skill sets, their unique visions, perspectives. Right. Right? So this is a place for them and it we also happen to have nice cocktails and food, right? So it's it's not just like a, a salon. It's it's a full on yeah. kind of, you know, food and beverage and musical experience, right? It's so, the pleasure of all this. Right. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be the big selling point. <laughs> well, Although I'm um, thinking about wearing my, my, my sort of silken Hill Hefner. That could you be my, can wear whatever you want. I'm going to have a smoking jacket. I don't even smoke, but really? I'm going to wear a smoking jacket. Hell it yeah. Be pretentious. Why not? Yeah. You know, I mean, exactly. some, sometimes it calls for that. <laughs> but, I, I'm, uh, but something I wanted to say about culture, you know, it's like, I know you're joking, but it's like you and I, you might not realize it, but we have a huge impact on on the culture of this organization, of the club. Yes. It really, and I, you know, as when I asked you about the uh, the drunken flower, that's what you said, was the owner. It was yeah. really sort of the, the, the draw. Because so you can have yourself, drinks anywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I think why the sort of yin-yang personalities that you and I have will work right. quite well. Right. Um, Chris does all the work. You take all the credit. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I love it. I love doing all the work. He loves it. I do. I love the work. I tore that whole place down. I know. Physically, himself, he tore down a whole entire house. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. I, I watched it from my messenger's pictures. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. out there in like, you know, 38 degree heat and I'm like, you know, pulling boards off the And that's floors. why he looks like that. And there we go. No, I, you know, <laughs> physical work is one aspect of it. But the other part is, yeah, doing the work, doing the work of, um, of bringing people together. Yeah. I mean, that's really what this is. This is the mm. gongan. I'm going to learn to say that right. So that ties. Can you say that right? I still don't know what you're trying to say. Gongan. Gongan. Yeah, yeah, gongan. No, I don't know what that means. I think it's a northern Thai. Peter, what's that? Come, come, come. Gongan. No. Yeah. Gongan. No. Gongan. Say it again. Gongan. No, sorry. No. I'm probably saying like toothbrush or something. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah, right. so come together. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, back to you. I mean, what, what's your journey after here? You're still going to go backwards and forth to China. You can do this Algonquin, but this is kind of your big project now. Um, or do you have any other visions that you want to share? 
I do. Um, there's lots of things that I'm kind of toying with. You know, I, I like toying with things. Sort of, um, I'm kind of a tinkerer. You know, I really like just playing around with ideas. And um, so I, I came up with something the other day. This, this is, I don't think we've talked about it. It occurred to me that I know a lot of uh, Farang men here who are not married and don't have children. Hello. You know a lot of them. No, hello. Well, oh. you, you yourself. Okay, so perfect. So you could, you could definitely be a, a part of this. So I thought to them, I thought about it, like who would, who would look after them when they're old? Oh. Right? Because, no, we're talking about like, <laughs> okay. you know, obviously your parents, my parents, like, you know, we have yeah. plans for them. We have like a way to look after them, you know, and part of that's financial and it's, mm -hmm. it's also us physically being yeah. here with them. So, um, but there are people who don't have that benefit. Yeah. So I thought, well, let's, I mean, I'm, I'm looking mostly at Farang men here. Those are sort of my peoples. And I thought, well, let's, let's put together a, uh, it, w it would kind of be like an elder care facility for us. And we'll right. call it Bro Haven. <laughs> well, there'll be a girl section too. Oh my God. Right? What, the Ho Haven? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to go through the Bro Haven to get to the Ho Haven because <laughs> bros before hoes. <laughs> So, okay, no. Okay, he normally comes up with really good ideas. I, I told you they don't all work. No. But, you know, my wife hates this idea. Uh, Color me gasped. Yeah. Hates this idea. And, uh, but all my Farang guys love this idea because it is something that's missing. So, for example, if you, if you try to, you know, get into one of these facilities in Chiang Mai once you're 70 years old, you're not going to be able to afford it because you probably haven't been saving for it. Your insurance probably won't cover it. So what if we took some property? We found some property. Right. Could be something that's just together. land. It's built. Okay. Everybody pay in. It's like fractional ownership mm. kind of thing. And then you kind of own mm. part of this thing. And when you that, die, you leave it. Correct. Somebody else can move in. Yeah. You can transfer shares. You can do something like that. Um, so you start planning early. Okay, so I'm 56 years old. I'm probably going to need something like this in 15 years, let's say. God, it's depressing. It's not. It's coming, right? Slower for me. Okay, great. <laughs> Must be nice. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I won't need this because I do have a family. I, but, like, I don't want to burden my children. You know what I'm saying? I don't want them looking after me. I don't want my wife changing my diapers. Ooh. Why don't I just create something where I can be with all my buddies? Because this is a key driver of health span. It's community. Yeah. And you've got to be around people that make you happy. It's back to community again. And I feel like, again, Algonquin, if you're in a place, if you're in a place that you love with people you love and you're doing what you love, you're going to live forever. I think you we know? could just expand the Algonquin into our community retirement, right? It, it could be our tribe already. We might as well just move move with them. Well, all the people that I'm talking to about, I was joking about it first. Yeah. And they're like, yes, I want that. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of screwing around. But now it's like, okay, somebody came to me that I mentioned this to. I was, I was you know, it was over dinner and yeah. drinking and just, I just sort of mentioned it offhand. And this person is a Bangkok person who comes back and forth here a lot and has had a lot of success in business in Thailand. Uh, kind of a mogul type person. And, that person called me up and said, hey, um, about this Bro Haven thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, I was just, you know, screwing around. He goes, no, no, I, I want to be part of this. And uh, I'm interested in, like, you know, funding it. Yeah. Damn. So things can happen. You never know. Yeah. Right? And then, you know, I, I probably am not a candidate for Bro Haven. But, not you know, because my, well, well, oh, my, well, I've got family. You have got family. That's true. I've got, you know, I've got a little bit of money saved up. I mean, I'll, I've got a plan, obviously. But um, a lot of my friends don't. We can, so. we can visit them. <laughs> <laughs> On the shuffleboard court. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah, exactly. Can tonk. No, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, I mean, like, this is trying. what, if we don't have something like this, we're going to find yeah. ourselves. So we're talking about, like, I, I'm listening to this book by, uh, you will love it if you haven't read it yet. It's Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind. He wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. It's all about his, his basically documenting his drug use. Oh. He's a, he's a journalist, but he decided he's going to go on this, you know, psychedelic journey. So he finds these sort of knowledgeable guides and people to help him do right. psilocybin, LSD. And then he, he writes about it in detail. Oh. It's fascinating. And he's a very conservative person. You know, he's not like a hippie guy, you know, just like... Drugs are not necessarily the purview of the liberal anymore, right? Right. Well, so, I mean, well, this is the thing. Like Johns Hopkins, these universities are yeah. funding a lot of this stuff for depression. 
and as a treatment for PTSD and depression. And he said something today, I'm listening to the book on my walks, and he said something today that really stuck with me, which was the reason why things like psilocybin and LSD are great for depression is because they help dissolve the ego or the sense of ego. And the ego is what really keeps you separate from everything else. Does that make sense? Yes. There's me and then there's everyone else, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when that's a really strong feeling, you're isolated. You're not together. You're not part of anything else because it's Pim having to deal with Pim stuff and it's all kind of mm -hmm. in your brain and, and, and no one else can understand you yeah. because it's you. But these psychedelic experiences, they have a common thing, which is this kind of dissolution of the ego. It's temporary, right? You feel one with the universe, a sort of one yes. with loving sort of embrace of this universal yeah. consciousness. And so what he's, why he said that's so powerful is because people lose this sense of isolation, of being separate and apart from everything else. Right. And once you break through that, now you are no longer alone. You are part of some, this great universal love or, 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 or mind, Have whatever. Have you done psychedelics? I'm going to. Oh. I've decided I'm going to. Good. I've never done any hard drugs. Because remember, remember when I did ayahuasca a yes, few years I, back? Yes, I've been thinking about that. And remember how I was so happy. It was about a month. What happened? It? <laughs> it wore off somehow. Maybe you should do it again. I was just so, the clarity, the, the, the empathy, the... It really, yeah, it really was rather wonderful with Shaman Steve from Essex, which is a, you know, Steve. I, I expected something a little bit more exotic than Shaman Steve from Loughton or something. That's hilarious. <laughs> I don't know, I just, yeah. Okay, so but, yeah, do it, do it. I, I will. I so I've actually I think it'll do your world of good. I've actually, so I tried, I tried mushrooms for the first time oh, with a certain idea. someone that we both know very well oh. because I really have to trust the person. Yes. Um, you need a guide. You need someone to help yeah. you. Um, Set and setting, as they say, oh, right? Lovely. Very, very important. Yeah. So I did that. That was kind of interesting. I didn't really get anything big out of it. No revelations. I didn't really it have... It takes a bit of time. I did not have a psychedelic experience. Oh, from, really? And part of that, I think, is just me. Yeah. Because I'm like... Mm. You haven't let go. You haven't... Yeah. Right. And I've always, I struggle as well to, to get the psychedelic experience. I, do. I had a lovely experience. I think experience. I'm too controlling. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. I don't want, like letting, I don't I like didn't want to say control. anything. No, no, no. Because that's, that's me too. I yeah. mean, so, uh, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. You know, um, I've always been sort of afraid of doing these psychedelics because I'm afraid I'm going to freak out, right? I'll have a psychotic episode. And lose control. Correct. However, he, there's something else that came up in this, which was you really need a strong ego to be able to let go of that ego and then be willing to take it back. Ooh. So if you're like an unstable person, who's not really grounded, mm. this is not for you, right? Because you will no. freak out. You will yeah. become sort of detached, yeah. right? Un unhinged or unhinged, untethered, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm all about it now. I really want to oh, try wow. it. Okay. Yeah, that's a big new chapter for you, isn't it? Yeah. It I mean, is because I, I think all my that. friends have, have all, they were doing it in college. I never touched the stuff my whole life. Well, you were and, in Tiananmen Square. And you were in China. You would have been like... <laughs> yeah, these drugs don't go over too well. No, either. not too, not too. Good. Yeah, but I never even... But even people offer me things here. I'm just like, nah. No, no, no you never really. Have. Not that I've been offering him anything. No, you never offer me anything. I always say that about you. Pim is just, <laughs> she's really stingy with her drugs. No, but I know, I know what you're up to here. I know what's going on here. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm all for it. I just, um, I just, I need the right yeah. set and setting. I yeah. need the right people. Sometimes and it's timing as well. You just have to be at the right time in your life that you're ready and you're open, you're receptive to it, and you know everything's the ducks are lying. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to do it if I'm hectic or stressed. It has to be. Absolutely. Yeah. It has to be well thought out. Okay. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that's concerned me a little bit, you know, because um, as I'm Thai, I'm also British. I've lived here most of my life, but I've also lived in Israel, Indonesia, Scotland, Switzerland, whatever, yeah. Canada. And um, as so I live a bit more of an expat life, you know, I've got my Thai friends that I've been with since five years old. We're still friends. But personally, I enjoy the, the more multicultural um, aspect of my social life. So I lead a very expat life. And in Chiang Mai, it's mainly dominated by men, yep. white men. And it's changing, the demographics, um, but I really am a bit afraid about our club. I don't want it to become kind of a bros club, like your bro haven. 
You know, so how are we, how are we going to deal with that? Right. Chris does have a lot of bro mates. Yeah, too. I do. I do. I'm very bro centric. Yeah. But that's where you come in. I mean, that's the beauty yeah. of, of Pim. I mean, no, I mean, you've got all the feminine energy. And I think it's essential for the club success. And uh, in, in terms of design, in terms of the music that we play, yeah. in terms of the general vibe, you know what I mean? Like, I'm very much in touch with like my inner gay man in terms of the design, but I can't be. You are good at the design. You're very good. Why, well, thank you. Yeah. But I, I, it's still obviously not a, a, a woman behind it. You can tell. You look at my stuff, and you said, <laughs> "What did you say when you saw my, what my, you saw my, my, my mood board?" You're like, "Very, very boys clubby." I think is what. Oh you really? Said. Yeah, yes. very boys club. I'm like, really? Is it? <laughs> I got like a pink velvet sofa. I mean, I can't make it more gay. <laughs> and your friend's like, "This is going to be the best gay club in Chiang Mai." I'm like, "Yes, it will. <laughs> not only for gays, other but, people but too. Everyone. Yes. Yes. So, it's I mean, inclusive. It, it must it be has inclusive." To be. I think it's going to turn off a lot of women and women are, I mean, I've met so many amazing women here that I never even knew were here just because they're not part of my social circle. This is a very fragmented uh, society here. It, it really it, is. It has become that way. I mean, to be fair, 30 years ago, I pretty much knew every right. farang in town who wasn't right. a missionary and maybe NGO, maybe teacher, because there was a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But anyone else I would know. And now... And, and quite rightly, it's grown. It's a big city. Of course, there's going to be subcultures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's going to be my job is trying to try and draw in people from the different subcultures and the different, you know, everything, and yeah. try and bring them in. I think that would be my job, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah because I just don't have that kind of reach, mm. and um, and I, I I think, as you said, like I mean, I have this very kind of close circle of friends. And they're going to invite more people like them. I mean, right? they're really cool guys. I absolutely adore them. Yeah. But no, your friends... Guys being the opportunity for But work. your girlfriends are awesome. And so yeah. they need to come and bring their girlfriends, yeah. right? And that's going to make it better for everybody. If it's, if it's a bunch of dudes just getting drunk and no. being... Right? No. You know? No, we're going to have activities. That's for have... bro haven. What activity? Oh, no, no, the guys oh, getting oh, drunk. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's in like 15, 20 years in Bowhaven. It's coming. Yeah, so I think that's it. I think we've covered pretty much everything. Um, I haven't really talked too much about you, but oh well. It's not that interesting. It's fascinating. But Chris, thank you so much. And um, I'm really, really excited about what we're doing. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's, it's how many more months? Three, four, five, six? I've stopped trying to plan. Uh, um, it's coming. It's, uh, it's coming. Let's, let's say September. Yeah. Yeah, conservatively. Say, yeah, yeah. We've got drawings. And of course, it doesn't have to just be, um, you know, members. Members can invite guests. So a lot of people will get to come at some point, you know, if they want to just reach out to us. And um, I hope you found this really interesting. I mean, this is basically, I just wanted to share our thought process of how we got here. You know, we, we're, we're good mates. We have a lot of conversations over coffee, wine, we craft do. beer. Um, not me, that's you. Mm. And um, and I think that we've sort of, over all the years of chatting, we've come together with something that I really hope is going to be really quite good for Chiang Mai, no? Absolutely. So there you go. Thank you so much and have a lovely, lovely day, evening, night, morning, whatever time you're watching this. Sorry, ciao.